Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I can teach you a little bit, and you can probably teach me. Um, Matt gave me the opportunity to talk about real estate today, especially for healthcare professionals, examining active versus passive real estate investing. About me, so I'm a physician. As you all know, I did internal medicine at Georgetown out in D.C., did a chief year out there, three years of pulmonary critical care here at Vanderbilt, just finished a fourth year, got a T30 on a T32, and got a master's in clinical investigation. I'm doing a fifth year now in interventional pulmonary, so I'm going to be a PGY9, which is crazy. I don't even know the number went up that high, but it does. I'm a husband. My wife, Anna, has been a huge supporter of me. She's actually from Maryland, and we just went out there for Easter to visit her family. I'm a dad. Rohan is our son, was born on my birthday last year, which is crazy. He was born on November 28th, the day after our wedding anniversary. So oh, wow. you can't make this up. Yeah. He's been a bundle of joy. I'm a business owner and investor. I love doing this. Uh, I love the game of business. I love investing in real estate. I think that you know, being able to do multiple things, even if you're a physician, is important. It get, helps you be creative, and it's just fun for me. It's a hobby, but sometimes I feel like it's my full-time job. Real estate experience, so why even listen to me? I have three long-term rentals out of state that we've renovated all without my capital into it and that we've sold recently, but I'll go through that. Two short-term rentals, this one that you're in right now and one in Hermitage by the airport. I'm a general partner in a 144-unit apartment complex in St. Louis. Matt's actually invested in that deal as a limited partner. I'm a limited partner in two properties, that same apartment complex, and then uh, one in Portland, Oregon that I invested in earlier last year that's 21 units. I invest in a crowdfunding deal, and I'll go through what that is, and that is in mixed-use retail units out in the Midwest, so Indianapolis and Chicago. I privately lend to a house flipper and developer. I run an investment group helping healthcare workers get double-digit returns through commercial real estate. And then one more, I manage a vacation rental here in Nashville that are not our own, so a portfolio of a few short-term rentals here. So first, I want to start with who would buy this property? You. <laughs> I know you would. Okay. Good, good uh, answer there. How much do you think it costs to renovate this property? <laughs> Fayetteville, North Carolina. More? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you think you'd make any money from this property? Or would you just burn it to the ground? <laughs> burn it to the ground? I, I know, you want to burn it to the ground. Well, I bought this property during residency, and we'll see what happened to it. We'll see. We'll, we'll go through it. <laughs> I just wanted to tease what's ahead. So why real estate for healthcare professionals? So diversification beyond stocks and bonds. So I'm a big fan of the white coat investor. It's how I learned to invest. I love Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett. I think everyone should invest a large part of their portfolio in low cost index funds. But I think it's important to diversify too, because one, you wanna invest in things you understand, and two, you wanna invest in things that don't correlate with each other. Because you put all your eggs in one basket, what could happen is, for example, with stocks, we've seen stock market crashes, We've seen real estate crashes. If, for example, one of those crashes, your whole portfolio could be devastated overnight. I know some people post COVID when the stock market went down, they were ready to retire and they couldn't retire right away because they had all their eggs in that basket. So it's important to invest in a few different things here that don't correlate. Steady cash flow. So this is incredibly important with physician burnout. Burnout's an all time high right now. I think there was a JAMA article which showed every specialty suffers from burnout now, administrative issues and just the job's getting harder to do. So having steady cash flow enables you to say, okay, I'm not gonna work as many shifts, I'm not gonna do nights, I'm not gonna pick up that extra job or moonlight somewhere I don't want to. You have that cash flow coming in to say, I can do what I want. Hedge against inflation. Real estate's always been a great hedge against inflation in terms of appreciating properties and rising rents. The tax advantages you mentioned, so depreciation and deductions are incredibly powerful. Healthcare workers, they make a lot of money, but they get taxed a lot. So this will be something that we'll talk about. Leverage to build wealth. So Archimedes said, if you had a big enough lever, you can move the world. And with leverage, you can actually invest a little amount of capital, really scale up your portfolio quickly, get into deals, and then play that monopoly game where you're trading up and build a big portfolio, starting with a little. It's a tangible asset you can actually control. You can actually walk these properties. You can see it. You can design them. You can understand the business plan. You understand the market. 
But something like stocks and bonds, if you imagine, it's not something that you can really control. Political pressures, the Fed interest rates, uh, the economic climate. Elon Musk posts something on X and your portfolio is devastated overnight. So let's talk about tax benefits. It's a depreciation. It's a discount that you get on holding the property. So for example, Dan, you buy a property, the IRS says, we know that this property is going to appreciate, but on paper, we're going to give you a loss on it based off items that will depreciate in the property. You can use that to pass it through on your tax return, and you can depreciate it on a schedule as a whole. So commercial properties over 39 years, residential 27 and a half. And they have this cool thing called a passive loss tax treatment rule, where you can use those losses to offset income. Not many other places you can do that. So for example, the losses on this property offset the gains on it. If you do medical surveys, for example, that income you have to pay tax on. You might even have to pay self-employment tax. But something like real estate, the losses can automatically offset the gains. Those losses be can be carried forward year to year if you don't use them up. And then you can utilize cool strategies like a cost segregation study where an engineer comes in, looks at every part of the house and goes, okay, this item can be depreciated faster. And you can actually do it on a different schedule to get more depreciation. You can use bonus depreciation to get accelerated losses too uh, in the first year. I've looked this up and I tried to figure out what else is considered passive income because I always thought for the longest time that you can use losses to offset capital gains and you actually can't. So it's really just rental income. I don't know why they don't just say it offsets rental income, but it's called passive income. A question I often get asked is, can you use losses to offset your W-2 income? And some people will tell you, of course, you can use all the losses and then you find out come tax time, they lied to you and you're wondering, why can't I offset my W-2 income? There's only two ways to really do that. One is called becoming a real estate professional and one is a short-term rental exemption. A real estate professional, the IRS says, you need to actively work on real estate 750 hours. So you need to do that as your full-time job. You can't do another job. There's a lot of case laws where people have tried to say, I'm a physician and I'm a real estate professional and they call people out on it. A strategy you can do is have your spouse be the real estate professional. Now that is one of the most powerful strategies is where they run the portfolio, they get the 750 hours, and then they can use that, those losses to offset your W-2 income in a year. So you can imagine how many hours that is per month, and you gotta be diligent about tracking your hours, and they actually see, are you doing anything else besides real estate? Some people have pushed the limits too, and it doesn't work out well. Looking at real estate, Underwriting real estate doesn't count at all. Going to courses doesn't count. What counts is actually managing the property, designing the property, running the portfolio, being a property manager, things like that. If you're a real estate agent, you can qualify too a lot of the times. Uh, but no, just looking on Zillow doesn't count. So the IRS says, okay, there's one exemption here to this rule. If you run a property for less than seven days, you can use your losses to offset your W-2 income with a lower requirement. So if you manage a short-term rental and you run it for 100 hours more than anyone else or 500 hours outright for the year throughout your whole portfolio, you can use your losses to offset your W-2 income. Are this turned on booking, like booking hours? Or Work hours. Like I'm actively working 100 hours more than anyone else, so my cleaner, my maintenance team, um, whoever's messaging, or 500 hours on your whole portfolio. And we were able to do that on this property and our other one, and I'll show you an example of that here. So who knows how long this is going to be there, but this is a huge strategy too that a lot of healthcare workers have utilized to offset their W-2 income. So if you manage any property in your portfolio as a short-term rental for 500 hours, you can use the losses from all of them to offset. Yeah. The hard part about this is you have to sustain this. So like what we did was we did all the work designing this, ran it, self-managed it, that got all the hours up, but we handed it over to... Uh, we have a director of operations now. We're not messaging guests anymore and doing a lot of that work, but we can no longer qualify. We could argue that we are doing it and for them, but like they're actually doing the work, and you know, that wouldn't be fair to say we're doing that same amount of work anymore either. So, you just got one here. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of people too continue to buy properties for this, but it's become harder to sustain this. <laughs> so let's talk about active real estate investing. Good questions. Like we'll talk more about taxes too. So what is active? Real estate investing, it's what it sounds like. You're actively managing it, selling it, acquiring it. Some strategies are long-term rentals. You buy a property, you put a tenant in, they give you mailbox money. House hacking, has anyone heard of this or done this? It's a, it's a powerful strategy, I especially think for early people in their careers, where you buy a house like a duplex or triplex and you live in one unit and you rent out the other. 
I think it's one of the best ways to get started too. You can use a low money down loan and get into a property. Um, I wish I could go back and do this. Flipping properties is more like a job. You buy it, something under market value, you sell it right away. Burr, bigger pockets coin this, is you buy a property, you renovate it, you rent it out, you refinance it so you can get all your capital back out, or most of it, within six months. The bank says, hey, you renovated this to the market competition here, we'll give you a loan on it, and you repeat the process by buying more properties. Wholesaling, I don't recommend, and I'm not gonna talk about it. I ran a wholesaling business for a little while and it was a pain. What it is, is you get a property under contract, you don't actually close on it, you find a buyer for it, you assign the contract over for a higher price and you make the difference. It's completely legal, people run their whole businesses off it, but you gotta call all day, you gotta find people, you gotta say that, you know, I'm gonna eventually assign this to somebody else and find a buyer for it. Short-term rentals. Pros and cons, who's heard of tenants, toilets, and trash? That's the motto for active managing. And it is what it is. So that's what you have to do when you actively manage a property. Now you can get a property manager, but then you're managing the manager at that point. And they don't have your best interest in mind always. So it comes with higher returns. The more work you do, the more returns you get. But it's a time commitment. And if you're not good with risk, then this is not the strategy for you. Passive real estate. So opposite, completely hands off here without direct involvement in day-to-day -day operations. Multifamily commercial, syndications, funds, uh, private note lending, REITs, offers lower time commitment. If you love what you do and you want to work your W-2 job and you're passionate about it, this is often the best way to invest in real estate because you can invest it in one of these ways with an operator and diversify. You're not going to get the same returns that they are because they're actively managing it. Um, but you are going to get good returns, which we'll talk about, and there's less control. You can't often dictate what they're going to do. They're the operator. They have the business plan to it. Let's talk about some of the things that I've done. So long-term rental burr. So I bought this house during residency. I was an intern at Georgetown. I started to learn about real estate investing. I read all the Bigger Pockets books. I tried actually buying a property in Washington, D.C., and it didn't work. Super expensive. None of the numbers made any sense. I looked for a market. I listened to a podcast where they talked about Fayetteville. It's a military base out there. Strong market, good rental market. Uh, a lot of properties like this that needed a little bit of work cosmetically. And more people actually rent than bought because they're in the military. So I started looking. All of these houses were flying off the market at the time. All cash offers going super quick. I put in a bunch of offers and I lost. And I finally got this under contract here. And I didn't even see it. I just made an offer sight unseen. And I was like, all right, I think this is going to work. Uh, this shows you my risk tolerance at the time. Because what did I have to lose at that point, right? I was an intern eating squares at the VA. So so I made an offer on this one and actually drove down there. We got it accepted. It was in probate. So um, I think this 96-year-old lady passed away, tried to go down to her kids. I don't. I think her kids were fighting about it, finally made it through. And then uh, it's just been in a state of disarray. So I walked it with a contractor and I looked at the numbers and I was like, I feel like this can be worth $130,000 if it's fully fixed up based off the competitors around it. I was like, okay, this will likely be worth 130 and the purchase price was 50,000 is what they had it listed for. So for me to use that Burr method, the bank's gonna give me 75% of that after repair value. I need to put at least, you know, I shouldn't exceed more than $40,000 for the renovation on this to get all my capital back. And even if it does, I'll still be in good shape here because I only have a little bit of my own capital left in the deal here. So I went down there and I walked it with the contractor and we decided on a plan and within three months turned it into this. So we put new floors in, we put new fixtures in, we painted. They kind of do all their properties the same. The idea is you're not renovating this for yourself to live in. You're just doing this to get it up to the market comparables and completely revitalized it. And what I learned was actually you can take a three, one and a half or three, one and convert it to a three, two. If you have a half bath or a washer dryer hookup, which is a powerful strategy at the time to increase the square footage and to get a higher after repair value. So that's what we did here. So if you had three bedroom, any bedroom or bathroom um, count, you can actually increase the bathroom count. If you have a washer dryer hookup that can be turned into a bathroom, another bathroom, or you take a half bath and convert it into a full bath. So that's what we did here. It was a three, uh, three bedroom, one and a half bath that we converted to a three bedroom, two bathroom because we took the washer dryer hookup and converted it to a bathroom. And then we just left the half bath. So I actually think it was a two and a half bath at the end of the day. And they, still the washer dryer, but... they moved it to a different spot. Yeah. 
and I didn't know about this, but he was doing this with all his properties. He was like, let's just convert that to another bathroom and get a higher after repair value on it. So we bought it for 55K at the end of the day. The renovation budget was 25K. We were all in for roughly 85K. And if you can do math, you realize that doesn't add up. So I learned a lot of lessons here. We didn't scope the sewer line. And I would always recommend if you have any property that's been sitting there for a while, you scope the sewer line. Because what happens is a property that's sitting there, the trees around it get in and they impinge on it. And we had a huge water backup that happened that destroyed all of the flooring. So they had to redo all of the flooring on the property. It's just a learning lesson. It's the first property. And there were some other issues that we had that came up. But at the end of the day, we were all in for 85K. Put a tenant in it right away as soon as it was renovated for $13.50. And six months later, I was right. So the bank said this was worth 133000 based off the comparables. They gave me a loan for 99750 So I was all in for eighty five. That's That's 100% cash on cash return. So I had everything paid for and I got some cash out of it. But here's the kicker. I didn't have any money because I was an intern to even buy this deal. So what did I do? Well, I went to two buddies and I said, would you lend on this deal? And what I did was I said, hey, I know you're getting one, two, three percent in your emergency funds, CDs. Uh, you're not really making anything on this money you have. Can I get you at least a 10 percent uh, return and pay you 10 percent per month for this first buddy and 12 percent simple interest per month for my second buddy? I said, sure, that sounds better than what I'm getting right now. They're like, what's the catch? How am I secured? Uh, you know, what happens in the worst case scenario? I said, well, like the bank, I will secure you against the property because it's an all cash purchase and there's no mortgage. I'm going to secure my first buddy as first lien. So if I don't pay him, he can foreclose on me and sell the property and get his money back. Second buddy, he was like, OK, what about me? And I said, well, you can be behind this first lender. But because there's more risk, because sometimes if there's not enough equity, that first person is the only one getting paid back here. They were like, OK. We'll do that, but you got to pay me more interest rate. So I ended up paying them 12% simple interest. Still way better than they were getting in emergency funds, CDs, and money market accounts. After six months, the bank paid them back. And to begin with, they didn't want to invest much. They wanted me to actually go through the process, build trust. So my first buddy was only like, I'm going to give you $20,000. My other one, $10,000. It's like, all right, that's fine to start with. So first buddy got 10.25% back. Second one got 12.36%. And if you think about the annualized return of the S&P 500 over the last 30 years, it's been about 7%. So already they've gotten a better return within that time frame. And where did I get the rest of the money? I took out an unsecured loan from SoFi at the time, 4.5%. Well, so I did this. I thought I could get all the money from them. And when I realized I couldn't, I, one, wanted to build trust with them to do future deals. But in retrospect, and I didn't know how much SoFi would actually give me. So I kind of backed into these numbers here. So I didn't have any money for this to begin with. I raised the money. I took out an unsecured SoFi loan. And I ended up getting all the cash back to pay them back and a little bit more. This is your story here, Dan. This is the property that we were talking about. So what did I see in this? I see opportunity here. Yeah. This was essentially maybe 10 minutes away from that property. So we did this right after. I had a team. I knew my contractor could get the work done. I was looking at nearby properties, and I saw properties like this fully fixed up. We're going to be about similarly $130,000. This also was a 3-1. It was the same model, but it was just in terrible shape. As my contractor said, this was a piece of work. And as you can look at it, I think a homeless person was living in it. Vegetation was everywhere. A tree was impinging on the roof. And the floors were coming up off the ground. But we went in there and did this to it. So again, within this took a little bit longer, four months, new floors, uh, new fixtures, new cabinets, stainless steel appliances, fixed up that carport, took the tree off, just completely revitalized the whole thing here. And this took a little bit longer. Learning lessons here, this was right about when COVID was starting. So the whole crew got sick and there was a lot of delays. My contractor left the door open and all the copper wiring got stolen in the house overnight. And he was like, I don't know what happened. I was like, what do you mean you don't know what happened? Like, you left the door open here. Uh, and he was like, I'll take care of it. I'll pay for it all. So that was helpful. But then there were so many other issues that came up, too. We thought the HVAC was good, and then it blew as we were, you know, renovating the property. But what happened? So 50 k purchase price. Renovation cost estimate was only a little bit more at 35 k I don't even know how he was able to do it for that much. 
we were all in for 95K here. Different time. Um, he had his own crew. He was sourcing his own materials. This isn't to say that you can get a renovation like that done for that same budget. But I knew that if you can do it for these numbers, this would work. The bank in six months said 130K um, at six months is what this is worth. We put a tenant in for 1100 got the same amount of loan, 97.5. It's 100% cash on cash return. Barely here, kind of skinning our teeth here. And this time we built trust in both lenders here. So my buddy, he was like, okay, I'll give you $60,000 this time. You pay me 10% simple interest. My other one said 20 and I had a little bit left over from that first deal here. So they got a still solid return within that time frame that was, you know, better than they could have gotten anywhere else. After repair value. So it's just what the after appraisal is once everything's fixed up. And I looked at that ahead of time and I said, if we're to fix it up like this and increase the size uh, of it, but we also converted the half bath here into a bathroom, it should be worth about this much. Seventy-five percent, ninety-seven five. Oh, the interest rate three point five percent. So the first one was three point two. I think at the time they were even going as low as two point nine. That was like when things were real good, and then this one was about three point five. So we were cash flowing here. I think the loan, the mortgage was only about six hundred bucks a month, a little bit more than that. Even after you took out the ninety-seven. Yeah, I think it was like seven hundred on that. What did you What did you take home after you paid the lender? Nothing. On both deals? The first deal, there was about 15000 okay. that we took home. This one, nothing because it was so tight. Yeah, yeah. But so. You still had the asset. Yep. And it was cash flowing. It was cash flowing. Yep. Yep. So now we have two properties here. So that's long term rental. Any questions on that? That was both an active. Uh, sold both of them. So we're trying to now shift and I'll go through into what we're doing here now with short-term rentals. I didn't see an opportunity to continue in Fayetteville. I don't see it appreciating out there and they weren't. The return on equity just wasn't there for me. I will say that there's a third property that we're selling right now that didn't turn out you know, all sunshine and puppies. So we bought it for 140,000. We put about 30,000 into it. So about 170 and we're about to sell it for about 195. Uh, a little bit of maybe a gain on it, but I think my goal now is to shift everything here to Nashville. And there was a lot of issues with that one too. The crawl space caught on fire. A homeless person we found sleeping in there. So real again, you got to be able to deal with all of these things, and a lot of things can come up. But high risk, high reward. <laughs> well, I got called. I got called all in one day that that happened, and then the tenant was suing us too at the same time. Uh, and then I think like something was happening with the plumbing, and, and I think I was working an ICU shift or something like that. Yeah, just kept on doing it. <laughs> you got to be able to do this stuff though, because if you can get through it, then there's a lot of reward. If you're risk averse. This is not the strategy, no. We'll go into more passive strategies though. And I think though there's a hybrid approach. You don't have to do this crazy. Like you can buy a stable long-term rental that's already fixed up and put a tenant in it in cash flow. I just wanted to do these methods because I think anytime you buy a value add property, that's where the benefit is. So Dan found this property uh, for us. And uh, when we moved to Nashville, I was like learning a lot about vacation rentals. Airbnb was taking off. Everyone was investing in Gatlinburg. There's a Smoky Mountains and Destin. It was completely bought out and crazy. But I was like, we're in the best city. Visitors keep coming here. There's bachelorettes. Everyone was like, but you can't do this in Nashville because of regulations. Well, I learned you can actually still do it if you buy in places where you can get a permit that are commercially zoned. So Dan sent me this one and it was commercially zoned by the airport. And I was like, okay, this isn't in downtown Nashville, but it's still got a lot of potential. It's in a very safe area right by the police station. A lot of people are going to come here. But it, as you can see, the design birds again, like very poor design, not themed at all. Um, bad property management company. They had bad reviews, bad cleaners. It just wasn't doing well at all compared to when I ran the numbers. I was like, this could get at least 60% occupancy per month with at least an average nightly rate of $300. And it wasn't getting anywhere close to that just because of what was happening. This was in 2002. And then we turned it into, oh, sorry, 2022. <laughs> That would have been too early. And then we turned it into this. So my wife with her design eye themed it after the Legends of Music City. So we had the same muralist who did this mural, did that mural. Um, 
uh, we were talking about, she does a lot of the murals out in East Nashville too. This record wall, which is a pain, which is over a hundred vinyl records that me and my buddy put on this wall. A green wall for social media. Every room is fully decked out and we took really good pictures. We had a really good team put in there and we've increased, here's some more pictures too. We increased all the amenities. There's a coffee bar now. Um, that didn't look anything like it did before. We put like a sound bar there and overall just increased the overall vibe of the place. And it's been doing really good because of that, because we made it unique, we saw value in it and we took it from where it was to where it is now. Purchase price was 650, but about 25K design cost yeah, back in the day on that one, 2022. We used a loan on this one, so we were all in for 50K total. And we used this cost seg and bonus depreciation strategy. We had an engineer come in, look at the whole deal and say, okay, or the whole place and say, okay, all of these items individually can be depreciated on a different schedule here. And with bonus depreciation, you can actually take a lot of that depreciation year one. So that year we took a minus $146,000 loss on paper. What did they look at? What are the different parts of the so it, I have to really look at it, but there's things that can go on five year, seven and a half year and 15 year. And it's little things like the kitchen cabinets and the HVAC, things like that. They just, you pay them a few grand and they walk through your entire house and they write out every little thing. If you don't do that, then you get a standard depreciation number, which is not as much. So most commercial buildings will do a cost segregation study because it's money for them to get an engineer in there. So I flew out an engineer uh, twice. So what happened was we got a tax refund that year of $21,000 because I could use it to offset my W-2 income. So if you think about cash on cash return, we put 50K into this and we got 21K back with the tax return. So that's a cash on cash return. Were you a fellow? Still a fellow? This, I was a fellow. So yeah. still I was moonlighting a ton okay. too. And then my wife's income also. Okay. Yeah. And what was this, my first year probably? Second year? Yeah. Right. So you can see the power here of using these tax strategies because we actively designed it, we actively managed it, and we were able to get the benefits here. This grossed 85K with net income of 27K in 2023. And you can see here, that's good, but expenses are so high for short-term rentals. So you're looking at a 60% or more expense rate on some of these here. You're, having, you're paying for laundry sheets, cleaning, everything like that, utilities. So you got to make sure your gross income is good, and then you're going to obviously get a high expense ratio that affects your net income. Any questions on that? So net income, what's, I may have missed it, what's, what's, so all that stuff, like all the expenses? Correct. Debt, um, utilities, cleaning supplies. The cleaner is passed through. We charge the uh, guest for Airbnb the cleaning fee when you guys have booked an Airbnb. Uh, that gets passed through, but it's everything else that goes with it too. So, yeah, yeah. As you know, vacation rentals are very expensive, and that's why the margins look a lot different too. So you make a lot more, but your expenses are a lot more too. Let's talk about crowdfunding and REITs now, which is a passive strategy. Streetwise. So I picked this platform because I was like, I want to start investing in a crowdfunding platform, go more passive approach. Three or four years ago, I invested in it. And what they are is they're a combined crowdfunding and REIT. And what crowdfunding is, is after 2012, the SEC allowed these big firms to advertise their deals on the internet. And they can pull a lot of investors' funds together to buy these big buildings, these big retail buildings. REITs are very similar. They operate like a stock where these huge funds come together and you give them money and they build all of these buildings in our major cities. So like in downtown Nashville, most of those buildings are built off of people investing in REITs. It's very passive because you're investing like a stock, you're buying a share in the asset and they're taking your money and investing it in the portfolio here. And I invested in this one that was out in the Midwest. They bought mixed use retail in Indianapolis and Chicago. And these are some of the ones here. Uh, some of them held, one held a Panera in it. There's some breweries that are in there, uh, just different type of uh, retail buildings in here. And the pros were they were open to all types of investors, so accredited and non-accredited investors. For those of you who don't know what that means, is after 2008, the SEC was like, okay, we have to start designating these criteria for investors that meet a certain income and net worth to know that they have the sophistication to invest in bigger deals. And if they were to lose money, they'd be okay with it. So a lot of big deals are actually not open to every investor. 
But usually crowdfunding platforms are open to both. So you don't need a net worth requirement. You don't need any income. You can invest in a deal like this. They buy in different types of markets. I thought that was cool. So a lot of crowdfunding platforms can invest in many different areas. And you can actually get diversified that way. They had a dividend reinvestment option. A lot of them have that too. Low to no minimums. I think it was only $500 to invest in this deal. So versus a syndication, which is as high as 50000 getting into a crowdfunding deal can only be 500 bucks. And I was able to invest through my self-directed IRA. So does anyone use a self-directed IRA? It's an IRA that you can invest real estate with real estate and other assets. So like you have your IRA 401k through Vanderbilt. You can actually open up a self-directed IRA and invest in anything you want, cryptocurrency, gold, oil, real estate. So I took all my old IRA money from Georgetown when I left, rolled it into a self-directed IRA. I did a traditional to Roth conversion and used all the losses from the short-term rentals to offset that. So I didn't pay any taxes on my conversion either. So I had all my money now in a self-directed IRA that I can now invest in real estate. Now I can buy... Um, you can actually buy full real estate with it, like homes, but I don't do that. I invest in syndications and crowdfunding platforms through it. So more of a passive approach. So I still now with Vanderbilt invest through Fidelity, but I have this extra IRA now too that can invest in real estate. So this extra IRA, like who, um, which um, Custodian. It's called uh, American IRA, but there's about 20 of them out there it's that can do it. Nope. You have to leave those big providers like yeah, Fidelity or Vanguard. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You're able to offset. Correct. Tax. Yep. But you're still like a 7000 a year tax on everything there. Everything's the same. It's just with a different provider now that you can invest in anything you want. You can go a step further and get a checkbook LLC where then you can actually write the checks on any, if you want to buy a business, if you want to invest in a business, that cocktail bar you sent me in East Nashville, you can even invest in that. Anything you want outside of stocks. <laughs> <laughs> so you can even invest in things like that so i invested through that uh, the cons of this low liquidity you don't uh if it's just a traditional publicly traded REIT like in fidelity you can trade that right away but in a crowdfunding platform you can't really do that uh what did i do here uh, because sometimes they restrict you from taking out your money right away this, this deal was uh, five years or I got a penalty if I took my money out early. I can't customize my portfolio. I couldn't select any of the investments and there was a 2% annual fee. So I put 10K into this just to start at a share price of $10.12 a share. Now at $8,000, it's $7.10 a share. Mm -hmm. uh, I've lost $2,000 on this mm -hmm. year. So do real estate's not all puppies and rainbows here. Uh, and they still take a 2% of that $8,000 now. So this is the issue with a lot of these platforms. The reasons they said was that Panera Bread was the sole tenant of one of the buildings. Panera, just screwing people over. They didn't renew their lease and uh, that really affected their portfolio. So this is what you really get into when you're investing in a group like this. When you have one tenant in one of these retail buildings and they're gone, the detriment of the entire portfolio is affected here. The share price goes down, your investment drops. They blame uh, inflation, rising interest rate, regional bank failures. <laughs> Blah 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 blah. blah, blah. <laughs> Panera. So, my goal with this is to break even, hopefully, and I can't exit right now or I get a fee on top of that fee. How many years? Three. Two more, two more years. years. Yeah. But this is a long term investment, right? Or is it, this is like a long, what's the time horizon for you? To get out of this? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'd get out of this at year five, probably. Because, I mean, it depends. So, re so I'll talk about this a little bit. Commercial real estate's been affected in different ways. Multifamily, I think, is still doing really good. Hospitality is doing good. Retail, since COVID, has suffered. You see all these retail places that are empty right now. Um, office has suffered. Unless I see retail coming back, that's the only way I would keep this. Now, the area I picked this because of the Midwest. The Midwest's a great investment market. But I don't know if I, and I didn't invest much in this. I don't know if I would stick with this long enough to, to continue. But I think if, if I believed in this a little bit more than I really do, then I think I would continue on. <laughs> right. So that's why. But this is what you got to be careful of on a crowdfunding platform. Do your due diligence. Physician on Fire reviews a lot of them. If you guys follow him, 
where there's one of Acre Trade where they invest in uh, farmland and things like that. Um, what's another one? Fundrise is another one too. The problem with this is you just, you don't know the person, you don't know the business plan as well. And it's just a lot of disconnect here. So yeah. in a syndication, you get a lot more detail. You can get a lot of raw numbers because it's a one-on-one -on -one type thing. Well, I'll talk about that soon. These deals, it's more of a, this issue happened. We're putting new tenants in. This is the timeline. Um, you can ask us for all the details, but we'll likely not give it to you or we'll fluff it a little bit too. Is that your experience too? Yeah. They try to sell it. It's more of a pitch because this is a, on a bigger platform. It's to a lot of people. There's a lot of money involved. And they'll try to tell you that everything is good a lot of the times. Now, if you really push them, they'll give you everything, but they're not as transparent. Like if you were to invest with a single person on a lower level. Yeah. Um, some of these have great track records, though, too. So some of the bigger ones, but you just got to be careful, like I showed you. So I can't wait to get out of that one. <laughs> Private lending. Who would buy this house? It's the same house. You're just looking at the inside. Who would just buy it? Well, who would invest in it? Let's say that. Depends on the area, market. Yeah. It's not a cocktail bar and it's not whiskey. So, <laughs> so my buddy, it's not Tesla. So my buddy, who's a developer and flipper and Fable, I've gotten to know him really well. And he knows the market. He's got a huge team. He knows how to deal with a property like this. So he acquired this at an auction for 50K. Put a hundred thousand. His idea was to put a hundred thousand into it to get it to be worth two thirty-seven to two fifty-five. He had the team to do it, but it was an extensive demo. So he came to me, and he was like, "All right, give me six months, and can you lend me money for this?" And I said, "Well, this is a big project. Uh, how much do you need?" And he wanted all of it, but I was like, "I can give you fifty k." And he was like, "Okay, what about ten percent simple interest, like I've done?" And I was like, "Dude, this is way too risky." So what I said was, would you do 10% off the top? And if you can think about that, simple interest payments are much lower than just taking 10% off the top of something. 10% off the top is $5,000, so you get back $55,000 here. And he was like, okay, there's enough of a spread here, and you saw what this looks like. You know, This is risky. So we decided to do it, but I was like, I don't want to be secured against this deal. I want to be secured against another deal. Because if I were to get in control of this, like, what am I going to do with this? Try to try to sell this. So you're actually able to do that. I've done that before. You can secure anybody against any property you want. It's pretty easy to do. So he secured me against a property with a lot more equity that was already done that I could take over and foreclose on if this wasn't going to work. Well, it's a good thing you weren't making any money. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if my investors would have taken this. <laughs> well, one is uh, ortho. Uh, he's done now, but he was an ortho resident in Orlando Health. The other one's a, a physician assistant. So uh, I don't know if they would have taken that deal. But I got a 21% annualized return because that was 10% off the top. So this goes to show that if you know the person, this is very risky. But private lending is you know that person. You can talk to them one-on-one -on -one and negotiate something. It's not a big platform. Uh, it's more personalized that way too. So I continue to lend to him. Um, returns haven't been this great they've still been above 10%. And I continue to lend to him personally because I know him through my self-directed IRA and personally. It's similar to what people did to me, but lent to me before I'm lending to him now. He's betting on himself. <laughs> basically Correct. So a lot of the times, if you find a good operator, you have no idea what happened to them at the end of the day, but they will always try to get you your capital back. They could lose everything or not make a cent, but their goal should be to get you your capital back. Um, and then hopefully they make money, but you never know that really. So, you know, if you find a good operator, you're always their preference to get you your money back. Relationships, yeah. Talking to people, references, things like that. Syndication and funds. This is kind of the big boy here. So anytime you're buying a big commercial building, you can enter into what's called a syndication. And they work based off a principle of you have general partners and limited partners. General partners are the people that put the deal together. They are the ones that find it. They underwrite it. They run it. They put a lot of the initial capital into it. But they don't fund most of the deal. They fund maybe 
5% of an entire deal, and they get limited partners to come in and fund the entire deal, but they get equity, so they actually own a part of the property now, unlike the private lender here, they get all the tax benefits, they get depreciation, and at the sale, they get money back. Now, at, for the other deals, it's just a part of the note, which is the terms. Here, it's equity in the deal itself. And they all work on what's called a capital stack. And what this is, is different structures within the deal of debt and equity. So at the bottom here, you have senior debt. And senior debt is the bank. So banks fund most commercial deals. And probably 60% they'll put uh, towards the deal. So the loan will be 60%, 70% loan to value. But they get the lowest return, but they have the less amount of risk. So you're paying the bank whatever the rate is you agree upon for the loan, right? Above that is mezzanine debt, which is sometimes another lender. You don't see that in every case, but if you can't fund the deal with one lender, you go with another lender above that. But above that is preferred equity and common equity. And preferred equity is that limited partner. So Matt in that apartment deal is what's called preferred equity. He has equity in the deal, but when we pay back um, after the income comes in on a property, the bank gets paid back first, and then limited partners or Matt gets paid back before any general partners. And general partners are common equity. So this structure favors all the limited partners in a deal. They get paid back first. There was a catastrophic loss and the insurance company had to pay out. The insurance company pays out the bank and then the limited partners and then the general partners. General partners have the highest risk but the highest return at the end of the deal when they sell. But there's a set um, preferred return that must be met every year for the limited partners before any general partner gets paid. So that's how a syndication works. And like for this deal, it was 8%. So we have to pay Matt 8% back. If the deal does 8% that year, he gets paid. If it does nine, then it gets split, general partner, limited partner. If it does less, he only gets paid. The bank gets paid first, obviously, no matter what. But that's how a syndication works. This is the number one formula to understand commercial real estate. So, and why I think it's the way I'm going and I'm no longer buying single family homes. You buy a house like this, no matter the work I do to it, the income it generates, it's always gonna be worth what its neighbor's worth. It's not a terrible thing. Appreciation, you're getting cash flow. But the way commercial real estate works is, if you increase the income on a property, the NOI, the value goes up. So if you execute a good business plan, the value is always gonna go up, you force that appreciation. It's not based on anything around it. So NOI is income of the property minus expenses, it's net. Cap rate, think of that as a standardization factor it's really just based off what investors will pay for a certain set of cash flow. It depends on the market, the asset. It's usually a little bit above interest rates. So for example, cap rates now for multifamily in Nashville would be about seven, eight percent. And it depends on where you are too. The class A buildings like the ones in Berry Hill where I live that are really nice, cap rates are gonna be lower because they're uh, lower risk, but cap rates are gonna be a lot higher for like things in North Nashville that are you know, you might get shot in. Well, we're in North Nashville right now, but you get the point. <laughs> so if you think about it, if you raise income and you lower expenses and cap rate stays the same or decreases, the value of your property goes up. The cap rate goes up and the NOI goes down while well, your value goes down. Here's an example. You buy a property for $2 million at a cap rate of 6% doing 100K in NOI per year. But there's a good business plan of renovating units getting properties up to market rent, lowering expenses. Let's say you bill back utilities, you put in low flow toilets, you fix the property management system, you hire better people, you lower expenses to get it up to that number. And you assume the cap rate, this is how we do it conservatively. You always wanna assume the cap rate is the same or higher. You assume a lower cap rate, then that'll be great if there's a lower cap rate, but that often doesn't happen. That would mean interest rates are going down, which is very uh, risky to assume. What's your new property value? Who's good at math? No one has to do this in their head, but it's 4.28 million. So it's 300K over 0.07. So that's how multifamily is valued. So you've doubled your value in three years by instituting a successful business plan. And that's why this is so powerful because then you either sell it or you refinance it and you get your money back to your investors with a higher return. Does that make sense to everybody? It can be a little bit confusing with that cap rate part in there, but um, generally this is how it works and this is why commercial real estate is so powerful. Cap rate changes. It's based off the properties that have sold in the last few months that are similar. It's based off interest rates too. It's 
it's a complicated way to think about it, but it's a standardization factor of what people will pay for a certain set of cash flow in that area. If you think about interest rates being 7%, cap rates usually result, revolve around 1% or 2% above that. What, what, limit, or what ends the The sale of the property. You can either refinance and you can get, if you can refinance and get the capital back 100% to your limited partners, you can keep them in the deal in per perpetuity at that point too, if you wanted to. Not a lot of syndicators do that. They don't keep them in there forever, but uh, some deals are able to do that to get them all their cash back. So now they just continue as cash flow. So here's an example of here how a limited partner gets paid. So this is an example of a $3.7 million, 44 unit, 25% down. Let's say you lend $100,000. Every year you get cash flow. Your cash flow increases on, you get quarterly dividends. So every quarter you get a payment. But it goes up every year because they're renovating units, because they're getting in higher income. So it goes up as the property gets renovated over time. But at the year of the sale, you get your cash uh, distribution, but you get a profit of the sale based off the equity that you have in the deal. So the property sells at that point based off what the cap rate is and the income. You get a distribution of the profit, you get that cash flow for that year, and you get your $100,000 back. So if you look at everything total, you're getting an 86% total return and an average annual return of 17.2% here. That's why this is so powerful is because you get that cash flow along the entire way. That final year, you get that cash flow too. You get a profit of sale because you're an equity partner and you get your $100,000 back. Are you saying how to offset the tax on that? Yeah. Good question. So uh, I wasn't even going to bring that up, but that's a good question. You're going to get a big tax bill at the end of this too. The depreciation from the property itself can be carried forward. So you can use that depreciation however you want. And it's for up to you to talk to your CPA and say, in five years or three years, this deal is going to sell. What should we do to either use depreciation now or hold it off until this property sells? Most of these syndicators will do a cost segregation study and uh, try to get you as much depreciation as possible. But it's up to you and your CPA to work together to figure out how do we offset this big tax hit. Of a deal like this, not meeting that NOI target. So, or your cap rate um, changes. So it goes up um, and up and up because interest rates go up and up and up and your valuation was a lot lower than you anticipated. Or um, there's you know major capital expenditure repairs on the properties where there's maintenance issues that come up and they have to do what's called a capital call. So they need more money to fix the property up to renovate the units, to get that income they projected. So that comes back to finding a good operator who finds a good deal, has a good track record, and you really scrutinize the deal. And I can, we can do a talk later on how to actually scrutinize these deals, but actually understanding the business plan. So for the, I'll show you a deal here, Lynn Townhomes. This is the one Matt's on, 144 units in St. Louis. These guys that I invested with really know St. Louis. That's their market. This property was bought in 1960 owned with uh, mom and pop, 96 years old. She just uh, decided to um, you know, not do this anymore, which I don't know how she lasted so long managing these properties, wasn't doing a good job of it. Her husband just passed away. This property hadn't been renovated in 30 years. Rents were at least 40% under market value. They weren't doing anything to it. This pool was not being used at all. This clubhouse wasn't being used in the right way. Um, it was just a mess, but you could tell what's around it if you look. There was at least four or five properties that if you were to renovate this, it could be comparable to. It was a growing area right outside of St. Louis. And the group I invested with, they actually own a few properties in that area and they were their own comparables. So they knew what rent this could get. So Michael, Nick and Mark run Matanza Capital. I've gotten to know them and they brought this deal to me and said, can you help us raise money? I said, sure. And they a deal this big. So this was $9 million purchase price required a bunch of people. For those of you that know a semi-retired MD, he's like a big physician influencer in the White Coat Investor Network maybe, but that's Kenji. He came in to, to um, raise $2 million for this deal because of how big his network was. And the rest of us were given lower thresholds, but you have to bring a lot of people in to do this. Is there equity matching the funding at all? It, so it's actually a, it's decided upon beforehand based on how much that you can raise. 
but you actually can't uh, get more equity for raising more. It's illegal. Some syndicators will say, if you raise us more money, we'll give you more equity. The SEC prohibits that. So in the beginning, they told me that I am like 4% equity. My goal was to raise $500,000. So that was it. That couldn't change at all. And Kenji's goal, uh, equity was upwards of 20% or so because he had to put in $2 million here. So it all is decided up front. And I'll show you here. So what I did was I really looked at the numbers um, and we can do this another time and go through that. But like I looked at all the comparables, where their market rents were, what they were projecting, what needed to be done. And here's an example of their last property that I knew they could do that was two minutes away. I actually drove down to St. Louis and saw it. They bought this one in Overland, Missouri by the airport, October 2021. They renovated 21 of 24 units. They lowered expenses, as I mentioned, that NOI calculation, new waste collection, lawn care. Um, they did a utility bill back. A lot of these old operators were paying for the utilities, which is crazy on most of the units. And they raised rents. That's the most powerful strategy. So upwards of almost 43% increase after the rehabs were done on these units. And they exited in 17 months with a 25.1% return on investment and an 18.5% internal rate of return or annualized return. So I knew what they could do. And this is the last deal uh, that they did prior to this. So what strategy is right for you? Well, I think the number one question is what's the value of your time? Time and effort. Active real estate requires more time, more risk, as we mentioned, effort, hands-on management. Passively, less time, and that gets into returns. You get higher uh, overall returns with that higher risk. You still get good returns like you saw. Limited partners still get a great return there on syndications. We talked about private lending, REITs, things like that, uh, both lower risk. Who is this ideal for, for active real estate? I think if you really have the time to do this, you really are passionate about it and you can learn from somebody and get mentorship. And then you could actually pick a strategy and stick with it and deal with all those issues. If you can't do that, then passive real estate is the way to go. Find a good operator, vet them, understand the business plan, and then um, have that peace of mind. If you're gonna do active real estate, long-term rentals, Buy and hold, I think, is the best strategy for healthcare workers. You don't have to do what I did. You could buy a home that is already done and cash flowing that makes sense in an appreciating area or house hack. And passive real estate, syndication funds, crowdfunding, REITs. I wouldn't recommend publicly traded REITs. I mean, I don't know. Do you invest in any publicly traded REITs right now? Uh, I do a very, like, yeah. very small amount. You're not getting any of those benefits, as I mentioned, by doing that. So what's next? Well... I think the biggest opportunity now is boutique hotels. And if you imagine all these hotels right now that you've seen, and I'm not talking about Hilton and Hyatt, I'm talking about the Motel 6s, the Knights Inns, these mom and pop hotels. They all look like this. They all are commercial properties. So they're all valued like I talked about, but they haven't been updated in years. Their occupancies are terrible. The reviews are terrible. And none of them actually have what you can see here. They're uniquely designed and run like a short-term rental. You can put in some tech that's pretty simple to get dynamic pricing where you can get higher uh, nightly rates. You can do software that's much easier than what they're doing. You can remove even that front desk person completely. So you can raise your income significantly, build a big brand behind it, and then lower your expenses and turn it into something like this. So <laughs> this is that boutique hotel. Um, this is Mike's boutique hotel out in Salem. So I'm in a short-term rental mastermind and the guy who runs it has a boutique hotel in Salem and it's themed after Halloween. So he kind of went all out. That's in Charleston, those two there. You can see what you can do with these really bad looking motel rooms. And you're combining vacation rentals like this and multifamily real estate. Less competitive right now, not a lot of people are doing this. And it's estimated 40 million baby boomers are set to retire in the next five years. And about 40, 50% of these hotels are owned by these baby boomers. So this is what I'm most excited about. And me and my buddy Garshan, we formed KNG Capital a few years ago to help healthcare workers get double digit returns through commercial real estate. And we're hoping to do a hotel next. We might do another deal with Matanza Capital. But selfish plug here, if you're interested, please scan this and join our newsletter. And we'll let you know um, about deals that we have right now. We do updates. We do um, teaching. We just taught about uh, how to interpret a K-1. And then if we find that hotel, we'll be the first to know.